started with our meeting. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Stephen Kern if he would lead us in prayer. And then uh, I'll ask uh, uh, retired U.S. Navy Captain David Swafford if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone could please stand. And Dr. Kern, if you would go ahead. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together here and meet. We thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation. Lord, we pray that you will help us as a people to continue to remember who we are and where we come from as a nation, one nation under God. We thank you, Lord, for leaders like James Langford that are men and women who stand for their faith. Lord, uh, we do pray for this nation that you would have mercy on us for we have sins. And Lord, we pray that you would bring revival and awakening amongst us. We pray, Lord, for our troops in harm's way. We pray for the leadership that's leading them and directing them. And Lord, you give them wisdom to make good decisions so that they can be successful and effective. Lord, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to live in this nation. We pray for the church in this nation, that, Lord, the people of God would, would wake up, would rise up and do what we need to be doing, Lord, to, to reclaim this nation for, for you. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet here together, and we just pray that you'll help us to be informed so that we can be, Lord, educated in the way that we make our choices politically. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Salute pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce our dignitaries that are here today. And I'll start with most important first here for could. Mike Pearson, where are you, sir? Oh, Mike Pearson's my personal <laughs> county commissioner. Thank you, Mike, for being here today. Also, I just saw Dan Fisher sneak in uh, back at the back. Newly elected uh, state representative from just west of uh, Yukon. And uh, Dan, would you please hold your hand up, please? And please give Dan a hand. And state representative Sally Kern with us today. Sally, please. And we also have our State Labor Commissioner, Mark Costello, with us today. Mark. Mark will be here speaking to us sometime in February. We haven't set the exact date on that yet. But uh, there's some important things going on in the state um, that Mark is very interested in as far as uh, uh, his position as Labor Commissioner. So he'll be talking to us about that in the near future. Also, uh, I saw Ginger Tenney walk in. Ginger, where are you? And Ginger is the, uh, the Executive Director of the Oklahoma Professional Educators. Please give her a hand. And then uh, we have some senior students here from Destiny Christian High School here. And I guess that's in Dell City. Would you guys stand up, please? And uh, this is your first time here. I'm glad you come to The, the one with that jacket on, you a football player? Well, I want you to know, my nephew's a homeschooler, and they whooped you guys the first time you played. <laughs> but then for the championship game, we got whooped real bad. <laughs> so, good to have you here today. And uh, <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's go ahead and... and uh, I wanted to read a couple of things to you first, real quickly, before we have uh, James come and speak to us. And I think this is real important. Um, one of the things that we're very concerned about here is Agenda 21 and a proper understanding of that. As a matter of fact, Sally Kern had an interim study this past uh, summer uh, regarding this, but it was about private property rights. And uh, she took a little heat like she always does in the Oklahoma Gay set over the thing. But um, I was called this past Saturday by Sean Murphy of the Associated Press wanting some comments from me regarding Agenda 21. And while I was on the phone with him, 
Senator Anderson called in and uh, he'd been trying to get a hold of him and so um, he went ahead and, and started talking to the senator. The article was in yesterday's paper or day before yesterday's paper. And just a couple of things here I want to read out of it. Uh, this is Senator Anderson. He says, the my no, excuse me, this is the Tulsa World message to Senator Anderson. Senator Anderson, the Mayan calendar was wrong. The government is not coming to get your guns, and the United Nations is not plotting to take over the United States. Now, in my opinion, unquote, uh, how many of you out here thinks the government's interested in taking your guns right now? <laughs> well, I, I would rather suggest to you that maybe you shouldn't be going to the Tulsa world to get your news and information. Um, but I love this this quote from Senator Josh Burkeen out of Durant, Oklahoma, or at least that's the largest community in his uh, district. This is what he says about Agenda 21. <clears throat> Agenda 21 is a comprehensive plan of extreme environmental social engineering and global political control and a socialist communist style redistribution of wealth. I'd say he's got it down pretty darn good. Understands it pretty well. Now, uh, here's a comment from Oklahoma City Planner. He says, it's an insane conspiracy theory that has no merit in fact. And that was from the Oklahoma City, uh, City Planner. So, I just, I just want you to know, that fella that thinks that this is an insane deal is a central planner himself on a small scale, probably running cover for the central planning on the world global stage here, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to him. Then yesterday, they had the, uh, the meeting down at the Capitol where the actual Shannon was actually chosen as the next Speaker of the House, as well as Brian Beeman as the next uh, Senate President Pro Tem. In today's paper, on the front page of the uh, of the Edmund, my Edmund, if you're from Norman, you'll have a Norman uh, state edition. But I wanted to read a few comments from Speaker Shannon. And remember when Speaker Shannon and Bringman came to our meeting on the 7th of November, we handed them a 13-point document. And one of those documents, uh, or one of the points was, is that they push back on the federal government every way possible that they can push back on the federal government. Now I want to read this to you. <coughs> T.W. Shannon, who made History Tuesday as being elected the first black speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, pledged to push pro-business and conservative principles to show the rest of the country how they create prosperity and said he would buck intrusion by the federal government. Quote, we live in a country with an out-of-control federal government that is bankrupt financially and morally, said Shannon. As a result, we have fewer, fewer freedoms, we pay more in taxes than we should, and there is little hope of these things of changing under our current president and this Congress. So let me say this, the state of Oklahoma will not be following the lead of Washington, D.C., not on my watch. In fact, In fact, we will push back at every turn, said Shannon, who at 34 is also the youngest speaker of the, in the state's 106 year history. I will tell you something, folks. Uh, we'll have to see uh, the legs that, that come about this, but I love the rhetoric that's going forward right now. And it's really powerful, and uh, so uh, time will tell. And he needs our support. And so there will be times this year if you're on the email list, and if you are not, we have an email uh, sheet, uh, sign-up sheet over here. Please be sure to put your name on that so you can get them directly. But there will be times this year that we'll be sending out an email urging you to contact your elected officials. I try to do that as little as possible, but when I do it, it's important that we do that. So anyway, I'm just really excited with the potential. As I've told T.W., I believe that he has the potential to be the most conservative and the best speaker we've ever had in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, time will tell on that. I also believe that probably the freshmen that were elected this year going into the, re into the uh, state legislature, 
and the House in particular may be the best group of freshmen uh, lawmakers that we've ever put in place. I think that we have uh, probably seven or eight that could turn out to be just really, really good lawmakers. And we may have uh, up to four in the Senate that could turn out to be very good lawmakers too. I will tell on all of this. So, uh, At this time, uh, Congressman Langford, would you please come up here? And um, I actually, uh, Mark, are you here? Mark and I can't remember the last name now. Had breakfast with you yesterday morning? <laughs> Nothing wrong with my memory other than the shot. <laughs> come on over here if you would. And, if you want that, I will get that for you if you want to speak on that. But uh, I, had, I had breakfast with a gentleman I actually wrote about in my uh, email, uh, went out the day before yesterday. And he had served two terms for congressmen out of the state of Maryland. He had served them as their senior policy analyst. And he hangs his head in shame about that. And he told me an interesting story. If he were here today, I'd love for him to relate it to you how that he was unelected, but he was the one that was actually representing the people. Partly because there's so much to do in Washington that many times staffers are assigned uh, to find out the information about issues, and when it comes time to vote, they ask their staffer, how do I vote on this? And then on the top of that, he talked about how to communicate When you would send an email, or some type of a message, he was the one that would communicate back with you and the congressman would never see that. And, and also he talked about how insulated that the congressman was from the people. And that was one of the biggest problems. And he was really ashamed of his, his uh, service in that. And, and uh, he's come to a place of believing today that the best hope for America is in the states' rights movement. So he's actually... Uh, forming a national organization. He'll soon be speaking in Alabama uh, at the Institute down there. But one of the things that I appreciate so much about Congressman Langford, whether I agree with him on thing, everything or not, he is willing to interface with the people. He is willing not uh, to be insulated from the people. He wants to hear from you. And he called me up and uh, wanted to just drop by and maybe visit with a few folks earlier and say a few things. And I said, oh, no, we'd rather have you as a speaker. And, uh, so, Because we were going to, to uh, watch the second half of a very good DVD called Indoctrination, um, the, the Destruction of American Christianity. And that's come about because of our, our schools, uh, partly. But anyway... Um, I'm just really happy that uh, Congressman Langford is willing uh, to have town hall meetings. He does. He has ever since he's been in office. He has a lot of them. He has some that are uh, online or by telephone or something. I don't know how. But I'm glad he is here today. So please welcome uh, U.S. Congressman, U.S. Representative James Langford. James, thank you. For But uh, just to be clear, I didn't call Charlie and self-invite myself. <laughs> I really did call and say, hey, I'm in town, this is a district work week, and I saw my Wednesday time at lunch was going to be open, and so I called him and said, hey, I'm going to stop by, uh, but I don't like surprising Charlie and just popping in as well. So I was calling as a courtesy call, and he said, hey, why don't you just take the microphone and field questions, and we'll pepper you. I said, I'm great with that as well. I just don't want to interrupt anything that's already on your agenda, because I do know Charlie plans ahead. Uh, let, let me just make a couple quick comments, and then I do want to take questions. Uh, we had 400 people last night at a town hall meeting in northwest Oklahoma City. Uh, it was packed. Several of y'all were there. Uh, we've already got a chance to talk about it. It was packed. It was positive. Uh, typically, when you, um, <laughs> i got to tell you, in political life, typically when you drive in and see the parking lot packed, you think, uh-oh. <laughs> it's going to get ugly. But it was. It was very positive. Everybody was very affirming. Uh, legitimate questions, and we'll talk through some of those uh, today as well, but uh, glad to be able to do that. The challenge of this task is keeping up with the number of information. Uh, I'm in town only one week a month, and I try to see as many people as I can and be around as many different places in three counties as I can. We have 750,271 people in the 5th District, and uh, I can assure you we do not all agree. And uh, so getting a chance to be able to hear all those different opinions and be able to interact with people and then be able to also lay out, here's what we're all about. 
Uh, so let me catch up on a couple things. Uh, if you have not seen already, the report came out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics this morning that Oklahoma City and the Oklahoma City metro area was once again listed as the best area for employment in the country. This is the eighth month in a row that this area, and so what T.W. Shannon says in other areas, and his, his, his great quote about he doesn't always read directions when he puts things together, but he always looks at the picture before he puts something together, and Oklahoma being the picture of what we need to pass on to the rest of the nation, I can't tell you how many times I've raised that up, and to say what we're doing in Oklahoma with energy, with limited government, with all those things, we don't always get it right, but I can assure you it shows evidence in our economy the difference that what we're experiencing in the rest of the country. Uh, put that next to uh, what's happening nationally. There were 7.8 percent unemployment. To give you a point of reference for that as you're interacting with college students and these students that are over here and folks that are in the job search world right now, this under this president we've had 43 months of unemployment above 8 percent. 43 months. And now we've had multiple months of just right around 8 percent. You would have to combine the previous 11 presidents to get 43 months of unemployment above 8%. So let that soak in. What I tell a lot of college students is, you think the economy's always been like this in America. This is different. The economy has not always been like this in America. Now, we've had serious depression times and other moments, I understand that. But this is not a typical American economy that you're graduating into and trying to find a job in the middle of. And we have to be able to turn this around. So the factors of that. I can't tell you how different it really is sitting in the budget committee. Uh, when I sit in the budget committee, the people on the other side of the horseshoe honestly believe that if we don't spend more as a federal government, we will never get out of this economic malaise. And I don't think they're just acting. I think they really legitimately, they're, they're hardcore Keynesians that they not only think we're, it's not that we're going into too much debt, it's that we're not going deep enough into debt, and that's the problem. If we would only borrow more, we would finally see unemployment go up. And we look at each other and think, we are not from the same planet. I mean, this is not even close. But the, the struggle with that is, we can fight it out and win it in the House. And the Senate right now can do nothing, which they're experts at doing. The Senate can sit and do nothing, and by default, everything shifts that way. So we, we, we have got to get leverage points. So where are our leverage points to work from? We assumed the fiscal cliff was going to be one of those leverage points. That our focus and the reason we even had a quote-unquote fiscal cliff was two things. Uh, really, there were three things. One was the Obamacare taxes kicking in January the 1st. The, the second one was the taxes from the previous lame duck time that they set a ticking tax bomb that went off January 1st uh, with the extension of all those tax rates. And the third thing is something we constructed in the House, and that is the sequestration. To say, if we can't get spending reductions through a reasonable, planned way of doing spending reductions, we'll just do it across the board, and we'll just keep doing it year after year after year until we get it. Now, to let you know on sequestration, sequestration is not a one-time deal. It's a 10-year deal. So when they talk about getting past the fiscal cliff and we'll deal with sequestration, sequestration's in place until it's turned off. So we have in 60 days, or now it's 50 days away, we have to deal with the two months of sequestration, and then we have to deal with the 10 months of sequestration after that just to deal with 2013. But you get to the end of 2013, we'll have another sequestration that hits at that point. So the reason it was put in there was to force Congress to deal with spending. That's the reason it was put in there. Because we're spending a trillion dollars more a year than we were just five years ago. Five years ago, a trillion dollars more a year. So the push is, how do we put these pinch points in place that makes us deal with the issue? Now, the one thing I can tell you is, it is at least forced the President and the Senate to have to talk about it. Now, the next step is to do something about it. Let me give you all some, some trivia that a lot of people don't know about the debt ceiling stuff, because we've got three moments coming up, including the debt ceiling. It's coming. A lot of folks look at Republicans and say, I can't believe y'all are messing with the debt ceiling and putting our nation into jeopardy because we're dealing with the debt ceiling. Can I tell you, the debt ceiling fight was originally a Democrat fight four years ago. Don't let someone poke you in a box. The first group to take the debt ceiling and to say, we will not raise the debt ceiling unless 
was a Democrat senator named Kent Conrad, who was chairman of the Budget Committee, and in 2009 let the White House know he will block an increase in the debt ceiling unless they get a fiscal commission to make sure that we deal with the debt. Now, Kent Conrad is a, is a semi, I'll use the word semi-conservative Democrat on fiscal matters. And he is one that wants to get it done. Actually, Harry Reid has blocked him from putting a, a budget through the Senate at all, even through committee. So Kent Conrad last year threatened, he said, my committee has done nothing, I'm gonna at least do a budget, and Reid even blocked his committee from even doing a budget at all. Uh, so, but he wanted to push on that. And in 2009, he said that to the president, the president responded back, that's a threat, and he said, watch me. And the president took it serious enough that he created Bull Simpson. Bull Simpson was created by a Democrat senator in the Senate saying that he would not raise the debt ceiling unless he got a fiscal commission. That's why the president didn't want to own it. He didn't want it in the first place. And so it went through all the gymnastics that was Bull Simpson. At the end of it, it wasn't approved. And then it kicks into uh, 2011, and we said, same idea. We're not going to increase the debt ceiling until we start doing something about the debt. This guy just wanted to form a plan on the Senate side. We want to actually do something about it. So we stepped it up to the next level. And the push was... We will cut spending as much as we raise the debt ceiling. If you do that 10 times, it's the bloodiest way to do it, but you finally get into balance. So if the Senate won't do anything, at least we've got to get a plan. I'm convinced the biggest issue we have as a nation is not the size of our debt, it's the fact we have no plan to get out of it. Nothing to get out of it. It is a perpetual, ongoing increase. And as it stands right now, by the time this president leaves office, he will have increased the national debt more than the previous 43 presidents combined. Combined. One presidency. I'm sorry. How can we hurry that process up? Of getting him out or of getting more debt? Yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, here are the three things that are coming up on spending. And we've got three of them uh, that the media will slam all together. They're not. They're all three separate. And we'll try to deal with them all three separate. The first one that will come up is the sequestration. As sequestration comes up, that is a product of the debt ceiling debate from last year. Our same focus will be there. We have to have a plan to reduce spending. That was the agreement. The House, the Senate, and the Presidency all agreed on it, all signed that into law, and said we have to be able to reduce spending at that amount, and we will continue to push that. Our proposals will come out in the next few weeks to say here are reasonable ways that we can deal with debt and deficits. Again, don't let people push you into a corner on what happened in, in December. The House of Representatives passed a sequestration plan in May of last year, May, to replace the sequestration for 2013 with other offsets. Very reasonable, dealing with government fraud, dealing with waste, dealing with duplication, stuff that we thought is no-brainer stuff. It's, if we can't agree on this, what in the world are we going to agree on? We passed it in May. Senate never picked it up. The next time the Senate dealt with anything was the 31st of December. So when people say, how come those crazy guys in the House waited till the last minute? We didn't. We passed our seven months in advance, and the Senate never responded. So we're going to once again put a plan out on the table and say, here's how we can reduce spending to be able to evaluate this and to be able to push it out in the forefront. Now, the window's a lot closer this time, so my hope is that we can stay on message. Some of the guys in the House are not good at staying on message and keeping it clear. We dropped one central message that we should not have dropped last year, and that was the Senate has not done a budget in three and a half years. When we were doing the countdown to 1,000 days, it was on TV all the time. After we got to 1,001 days, it dropped and it just disappeared, and I have no idea why. We're about to reach year number four of the Senate not doing a budget. And so our push will be, you cannot resolve the financial issues in our nation if there is no budget. And there's no moment for the, the, the folks that catch me in the media and say, why are you fighting over debt ceiling? We haven't done this before. I give them a quick reminder. Don't forget President Obama, when he was Senator Obama, voted no on the debt ceiling increase. And that Kent Conrad, the Democrat from the Senate, held up the debt ceiling until he got his fiscal commission. So this is not some, something new. But in addition to that, the best time to do this is during a budget debate. But if the Senate won't do a budget debate, you tell me when else we can do this. This has to be done. And so we have to be able to develop that plan to do it. So we try to come back with a reasoned response 
to say if we have to do this, when else is it going to occur? If Congress, if I've learned anything from Congress in the two years I've been there, it's that they never do anything until they have to. I mean, it's the last possible second, which is usually well beyond what the private market needs them to do. So that, that's one piece of it, is the sequestration. The second piece I already talked about is the debt ceiling piece of it. That's coming up in the next 45 to 60 days. And then we also have a continuing resolution because the Senate's not passed a budget. So we're functioning under this continuing resolution. Now let me give you some clarity on this as well. that will help in ammunition for you. The continuing resolution gives a tremendous amount of latitude to the executive branch. The Senate does not want to pass appropriations bills and replace it because they're still functioning off the 2009 model the last time they did it. They don't want to change that. And the difficulty is, constitutionally, there's nothing built into our system that says that the House can hold the Senate to account for not doing their constitutional responsibility. The, the Constitution assumed honorable men and women would be there. And that's part of the challenge that we deal with right now. People say, how can you make them? Well, there was no consideration for someone violating their oath. But that's what we have right now. So we're, we're working in untested ground. So when we deal with things like the debt ceiling, for instance, if we get back to the 1995 time period when we shut down the government, at that time in 1995, most of the appropriations bills had already been passed. So when we did a government shutdown, we were shutting down things that we hadn't already appropriated, things like national parks, interior service. But military had already been funded. All those other areas had already been funded. So the government shutdown was over the relatively small amount left. Now we deal with, if we do a government shutdown, there is no other appropriations done by the Senate. They won't pick them up. It's a complete government shutdown all the way across the board. If we deal with a debt ceiling piece, it gets more toxic. Because if we deal with a debt ceiling piece, it actually doesn't shut the government down. It moves the authority from making decisions about spending to the executive branch. Now, here's the dangerous part for us. Because we have a lot of conservatives that say, shut it down over debt ceiling. And I say, you've got to ask the if-then question. If we shut it down over debt ceiling, everything's still authorized. Continuing resolution is still in place, but we're in emergency measures, which kicks it into the Treasury Department, which at this time looks like that will be Jack Lew rather than Timothy Geithner, though we'll terribly miss Timothy Geithner. Okay? It'll, be, it'll be Jack Lew heading up the Treasury Department, Ben Bernanke and President Obama making decisions about how we do spending. Now, I don't like that scenario at all. So we've got to tread carefully when we deal with debt ceiling pieces. But we have got to find those pinch moments that we can bring the American people along with us and say, if we don't reduce our spending, we will collapse this economy. And it will hurt the most senior adults with fixed incomes and those that are in poverty. They will be the first hurt. The group that they say they're going to stand up and defend will be hurt the worst. And so we have got to stand up and do this. Now, as a conservative, I'm going to tell you, we spent the last two years talking a lot about numbers. But as conservatives, you and I both know our first passion is for people and our own individual freedoms and liberties. So we need to be careful in our own communication to make sure people outside of us don't hear us just talking about numbers like all we care about is money. Because money's not the issue. People are the issue. I'm a firm believer where your treasure is, your heart is also. And if we only talk about money all the time rather than about people, we're exposing to the world our heart's all about money. It's not. It's about people and personal liberties and our families and the future of our nation and our children. So make sure in our rhetoric when we talk about things, we keep that front and center. And that we don't lose track of that and we don't communicate something to somebody else that we don't really believe. Does that make sense? Let me hit on a couple things and let me field some questions before I, before I filibuster us out of time. Um, gun control. Uh, anybody heard any news about that lately? Uh, the, I, the, the town hall meeting last night, I, I just, if any of you have been to my town halls, we just take a question from everybody that wants to write a question and I just randomly draw them out of a bucket. And so we never know where the questions are coming from. They're unfiltered. Whatever anybody wants to ask, they've got the floor, they can ask it. The, for those of y'all that were here, over half the questions were gun control questions last night that we drew up. All, all perspectives. Very interesting to be able to hear. Rightfully so, by the way, uh, of, of what's happening. I can tell you it's interesting to be able to hear some of the Democrats that are from more conservative states 
like the new senator that was just elected in North Dakota, where they, I believe, I think they have the highest per capita gun ownership in North Dakota than any other state. And a brand new Democrat senator has already come out and said, I'm not for any of the proposals that the White House has floated. Okay, <laughs> we'll see if that holds, number one. But it's an interesting signal immediately to be able to come out and to say that they're going to have to tread carefully. There is a reason the president has not gone after gun control the first four years, because even some in his own party are not with him on this issue. Now, while I can tell you with great fervency, the last thing you should do is depend on a Democrat to vote with you, there is a reason that they've gone slow on that, because that's a really, really toxic issue for the White House and a lot of those last remaining blue dog, quote unquote, seats that are out there. Uh, so we'll see how this, how this moves forward. I, I am one to be careful to say when people talk about what happened in Sandy Hook, I had the same reaction everybody else did. I've got two kids in school. I had to drop them off at school the day after that and deal with all the emotion of that. I'm the same as every other parent. But I am committed that we don't do something because it makes us feel better that we did something, that we do what actually helps solve the problem. And most of the things they're recommending, number one, aren't constitutional, and number two, don't solve the problem. So my focus is going to continue to be when people raise something up, say, how would that answer the, how would that solve that problem? How, how does that fix that? D -d does that fix that at all? If it doesn't fix it, why are we talking about that? Let's fix the problem, not just do something to say that we did something. A lot of our issues do circle around mental health. <coughs> But let me just say this in this room, we have some gut checks on that as conservatives on mental health issues. Because the left will use mental health issues and say, okay, we need to make sure, well, what, what, what does that mean? Exactly who has the authority to take away your Second Amendment right? Is that a teacher at your school? Is that a, a, a psychologist or a therapist? Who has the ability to take away your Second Amendment right? Well, we've settled it in our law, it's court. He's the only one that can do that. And that has to be a decision made in the court. Well, what does that mean? And how do we operate? I, I don't have a lot of interest for someone that is in a mental health situation walking around with a gun. You don't either. We settled that as a nation decades ago. I don't have any interest in a fellow walking around with a gun. We settled that as a nation years ago. But how do we resolve this? I think we should have that open conversation, but I think we better go careful on it because their agenda is very different than ours. And we'll, we'll have to be attentive to that. I would say to you, be really cautious on what you believe, because a lot of the groups in D.C. and around the country are very effective fundraisers on fear. And they do it, their conservative groups do it as well. They will throw stuff to you and say, oh my gosh, send me $100, or they're coming after your classic derringer that you have on the wall, okay? So, I mean, be cautious on it, on what you believe, and let's check it out with facts. Uh, because there, there's plenty of, of, of scare stuff on both sides. Um, Health care has not gone away, by the way. Uh, I just was assigned to a brand new committee, and I'm committee chairman of a committee on oversight and government reform. Uh, it is the committee on po uh, energy policy, health care, and entitlement reform. And I could not be more excited about chairing that committee, uh, because that, that is the sort of a lot of we will start taking on the issues as quick as we can to deal with the oversight of that, but it is massive. And so we're trying to prioritize some of those issues, but a lot of it will come down to a lot of the abuses that have already come out in Obamacare. I wish I could say we could pull Obamacare out by its roots. Obviously, with the Senate election that happened last time, we have little chance of that. Now we're in a very hard situation that as conservatives, all we can do is when it starts getting implemented, say, I told you so. <laughs> Let's get that out. And as that gets rolled out one piece after another, we're going to continue to say, I told you so. Now it's time we pull out that piece. Now it's time we pull out that piece and keep going. So it's not been forgotten. But we are going to have to shift strategies and to be able to stay after it. And I, and I hate the fact that some of it's going into effect already. One other quick political statement, and then let me field some questions. We're doing time. OK, yeah, I narrow. Because um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions stuff. President Obama's been pretty clear about what his political strategy is now. His political strategy is beating 17 House Republicans 
so he can have his last two years just like his first two years. His campaign is still fully operating. And I've had folks even here say, not here today, but here back in district say, oh, the president's still campaigning. See, he's still campaigning because he has one more election to go. Two years from now, if he can beat 17 House Republicans, Nancy Pelosi has the gavel again, and he gets to do Obamacare and Dodd-Frank and all that kind of stuff that he did the first two years, he gets to end his term the same way as he started it. So you can be assured of a couple of things. He has a divide and conquer strategy, just like he did in the nation during his national campaign. He has the same thing with House Republicans. His goal is to raise up issues and to push us in a way that our House is divided and we lose 17 seats and he does not care from where. He does not care. So as conservatives, we need to be attentive to what that strategy is. And they're good at politics. They're horrible at policy, but they're really good at politics. So, yeah, yeah. so we, we, we've got to be attentive to that and what we're going to do to be able to not only maintain the House, but to grow the House. That to us is we actually implement what we believe and we tell the American people this is why this works. As conservatives, I think sometimes we chase people around with a flu shot needle saying, really, you need this flu shot? Stop for a second, I'm going to give it to you. Okay? when we need to be able to communicate better to the American people to say, if we implement what they want, this is what happens to the economy. If we implement what we think is right, this is what happens to the economy. And to be able to lay that out in a reasonable argument. But we've got to be able to address that in the days ahead. So we should not be ignorant of what the opposition wants to accomplish. They just need 17 seats. And they flip the house. So let me, let me field questions. How do you want to handle questions? First. Explain to the people the position, the leadership position that you ran for. Tell me a bit of what that entails and then what that question Yeah, it's a great time to be in leadership in the House. <laughs> uh, um, about, I don't know, seven months ago or so, uh, my wife and I were praying and talking through one weekend when I was back home and said, okay, my, I'm getting through the end of my freshman year. God willing, if I'm elected again and I go back, how can I make the best difference here? As we prayed and talked about it, there's one seat at the leadership table called the policy chairman. It's been all over the map with what it does, but it gives you great latitude to go through a lot of the policy issues. It's designed to be a think tank, to bring ideas to the conference. It's, it's not in the normal committee structure, but it is its own committee. There are about 40 members of the policy committee that I would lead, but then we'd work to try to bring ideas and try to bring consensus to our party together and then push it forward to get it done. So pray talk about that, but we've already had a really good guy there, uh, Dr. Uh, Price, uh, Tom Price from Georgia, a solid conservative guy who was already there in that spot. I said, you know, I'd, I'd really enjoy doing that, but there's, uh, Dr. Price is doing a great job. There's no way I'd ever challenge him. Then I find out, sit down with Dr. Price, and he tells me he's leaving that position. So sitting down, I talked about it, and we prayed back and forth, and I chatted with a couple of folks there, and I said I'd be interested in running for that. Now, it's an internal election, which... It's, it's, you think a normal election here is crazy. I mean, Sally knows and watches the internal House elections, and, and Dan will shortly of all that happens on it, but it's nuts uh, to be able to go through those internal elections that are like that. So, went through the election, was elected as the chairman of the policy committee. It's the number five ranking position in the House of Representatives. Won that seat, started that last week. Now, here's the interesting challenge of it. I sit at the leadership table with a very diverse leadership body, headed by John Boehner. So no matter what your opinion is, he is the Speaker of the House at this point, and there's still a lot that runs through that. So my voice is to be an independent voice of policy ideas, to be able to bring policy ideas in it. Now, I have two opinions. I don't remember if we talked about this or not. There are two attitudes on what you do with leadership in the House when you're there. One is you're on the outside and you throw bricks at it and try to affect it by throwing bricks at the leadership table from the outside. The other one is to get inside the room and throw bricks from inside the room. <laughs> and then, quite frankly, most of the time, if you're in there and you throw bricks inside the room, once you walk out, I'm not going to throw bricks anymore because I've thrown my bricks inside the room. And I'm not going to be the, the Mr. You know, go-along yes-man outside, but I had my shot. So my decision was I'm going to try to get in the room and make the greatest amount of influence I can. Now, whether I'm being optimistic and I'll be able to make an influence or not, time will tell. But that, that's my commitment to step in and do that. And so we, that process has already begun. And we'll see 
if bricks from close range make a difference. I'll let you, I'll let you call, folks. As much as you possibly can, ask questions. Don't give us a long speech in your opinion about things. We'll start right back here. So don't, don't pull a Charlie, ask a yeah. question. That's exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> charter for the private federal reserve ends in 2013 what happens do you just automatically sign them up for another 100 years okay can i just tell you i have no idea okay i'll, I'll have to go look at that to be able to find out there. that's a great yeah question. that's a great yes, question yes, um, i called the night of the fiscal cliff vote and whoever you have as your clerk is awesome Thanks. she was intelligent probably best of any of them i've ever talked to good um, we really have a great staff there. Yeah. Thank you. She's great. I forget her name, Lindsay or something. My question is regarding the guns, and is Washington at all aware of the psychotropic drugs that these children are taking? Because I guarantee it, 100%, that's our big problem. Yeah. Um, I'm a little afraid about what I'm hearing about the psychiatric uh, bent, as far as running people through nurses and psychologists. Yeah. Okay, okay, because they want to put them on drugs. Right. I, I agree. I agree with that. I think there's a bunch of issues that, uh, quite frankly, <coughs> most liberals are afraid to talk about. Where are we on all the violent movies? Where are we on all the violent video games? Where are we as a culture? Right. We have disconnected from a lot of those things. Where are we on all these psychiatric drugs? And uh, we've over medicated kids. Quite frankly, some of the over medication of those kids are because welfare moms want to get additional benefits, and if they can put them on SSI through maintenance drugs, they can also put them on Social Security Disability and they get a separate check. That is wrong on every single level. It not only is fraudulent to the government, but it tells a kid with great potential, don't try, you're disabled. That is wrong, and so we got to fix that. Back to back. I'm working to everybody. Yeah, good, morning. Uh, good afternoon, Congressman. I'm from your district, sir, District 5, and uh, I have a close friend who's a congressman. You talk about throwing bricks inside the room as opposed to throwing from outside. He's a close personal friend. And I would like to hear your explanation why you voted to throw Tim Hills down and Justin Amash, the most conservative fiscal congressman there are, off the budget committee because of their stance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Be glad to talk about that. Number one, I didn't do that in that sense. I'm on the steering committee, so okay. let me make that. You didn't vote again. You let, didn't let, vote. Me make that, let me make that clear on that. But I, I want to be able to answer your question. There were four different individuals that lost a position on a on a committee that they're on. And did you show them the card, sir? The vote? Let him answer, and then we'll, we'll come back to you. Tim Gilskamp and I sat down for over an hour last week. Does that help you? And Justin? How did you do with him? Justin has not asked for a meeting, but Justin and I are friends. Okay. And so Justin and I have talked often, freely. And so we're in the same class together. Tim and I are in the same class together. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, who moved up. Uh, let, let me start this way. <coughs> All those guys are friends that I interact with and I talk to all the time. This notion that some of their, quite frankly, their fundraisers put out, that they're the most conservative members of the House, would surprise Michelle Bachman, who was not removed from a committee. Fiscally conservative, sir. I would say Michelle's pretty fiscally conservative. Compare the votes, sir. Compare I, I, the votes. I, I'd be glad to compare the votes on that. Uh, but you can walk through Steve King. Uh, Michelle Bachman, uh, Tom Price, Paul Brown, uh, Alan West. You, I mean, you can go through all, a whole series of, of individuals and to see the notion that it was the conservatives that were taken off is not true. Now, are they conservative? Yes, they are true. Uh, that is true. Uh, but th this notion that there was some target to say find the most conservative members and remove them, you'd have to look at the voting records and be able to see that they are, they are very conservative voting, very solid members. But this was not some target to say, find the most conservative and pull them off. Austin Joe. Um, I'm told that you voted to support the National Defense Authorization Act. And um, I think that's an egregiously unconstitutional bill. And I think the entire Oklahoma delegation should be removed from their seats for supporting that okay. bill. Yeah. And did you also support the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act? Yes. 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 Let me. That's also an unconstitutional bill, and I'm stunned that a conservative would support those bills. 
Okay. Let me, let me try to answer both those. The, uh, and I'll try to go in reverse order on that. The FISA bill deals with foreign intelligence, obviously. And I know there's a lot of stuff that I've seen on the Internet as well. I've gone into classified briefings and have asked hard questions on that. I am, I am one of the few members that actually attends the classified briefings on the bills as they're coming up on intelligence to go in, sit down, and read not only the, the public part of that, but that's one of the few bills that actually has a classified version as well, that you'll just have a single page, the rest is classified. I've gone through that part as well. My questions were satisfied, that there were legitimate constitutional protections that were in place. It is the same with NDAA. I have a difference of opinion. I have a difference of opinion with people when they look at NDAA, and I ask the question, where is the text that removes habeas corpus from an individual that is a bill that can be passed that removes a constitutional pr protection. Section 22. It's, it, it is not there. In fact, in the, the 2012... And in the 2013... Let me jiggle the wire here. Okay. 2012 and 2013, it specifically states in there that this does not remove habeas corpus. It doesn't apply to American citizens. I mean, it goes through all this detail when you see the text to make sure that it makes it clear that anything that was ambiguous in 2011 clarifies it in 2012 and 13. So there's no so, section 1021 or 22 anymore? You're talking about from the 2011 version? Right, so that's moved? The, two, the, the section 1021 and 1022 have both been clarified in 2012 Perfect. and the 2013 clarified. version. Clarified. To clarified to make sure that, it, that anyone, because both of those, what I've heard from people is, it's not what it says, it, it's what it doesn't say. Right? It, it's not that it says it gives ability for someone to have indefinite detainment for Americans. It's that if you were to say it doesn't say, and so it might mean all those things were clarified in the 2012 and the 2013, and I would be glad to send the actual full text. I've had several folks that have sent me the text and said, it says this, so it could mean this, and I've said, you don't have the complete text. Let me send you the entire section and so you can see it. Some of the stuff floating on the Internet, I'm just going to tell you, is a section of the text and not the complete text. Why do let, me do this. let me do this so we don't get bogged down here. If you're concerned about this, get your email address to him after this and let him send you the full text. Why don't you just so put it up on the Facebook page? Yeah, no, I'd be glad to. Okay. No, I'd be glad to do that. I'd be, I'd, I'd be glad to do that because we, with that, I can assure you when NDA came up, that's the first section we turned to. Bob, I'd be able to go to. Congressman, uh, every couple of years, there's been this 10-year plan laid out. We're, we're going to trim a little bit down, but we're guaranteed to do a lot more on the budget yeah, never in happens. six, eight, ten years. Right. And of course, it never happens. All right. The, um, now, with that in mind, though, the commitments made about dealing with okay, we have this small tax increase now, but we're really going to hammer down on expenses in 45 days. Uh, why should anybody believe that? I just expect another tax increase to come. Why? Why not have Harry Reid and President Obama just propose another tax increase? and leaving the ball in the House of Representatives court that they're stuck with. Yeah, that is the reason I voted no on the fiscal cliff, because it did not include that assurance. Uh, the fiscal cliff was originally designed to be a moment to deal with our spending issues. Spending wasn't dealt with at all. It's a tax moment. The president was successful at cornering everyone to get into just deal with taxes. Now, I'm going to tell you, there are some benefits we as conservatives gained from the fiscal cliff thing, but it's about this much and the amount of spending that's in it equals or exceeds the amount of tax increases that are in it. <coughs> and so that's the reason I voted no, was that reason exactly. All right, let's start over here. We'll go with you, sir. Is there anything we can do to uh, affect the, uh, the prospective shipment of jets and tanks to Egypt under a proposal that was uh, agreed upon with the with previous dictator, Mubarak? Uh, yes, we're continuing to push on that. We put stipulations on any aid there that they have to maintain their treaty with Israel as a first priority. They have to maintain an open government. Uh, the problem is the evaluator, that's the State Department. I mean, that's, that's the challenge of it. But yes, sir, there are some limitations that can be done. I think there is broad support in the House. There are some Democrats that are with us as well uh, on dealing with the issue of Israel. Israel has pretty strong bipartisan support. In fact, the most bipartisan support that we have, that I've seen since I've been there, circles around the, the nation of Israel. And all we have to raise up, is, and you can sh see that with Hegel, and him facing all the opposition he has from so many people on his issues with Israel. But when you deal with Egypt, you're dealing directly with, with Israel. Back wall, there. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
So there's a tremendous number of executive orders that I've done recently that has increased. Some of the executive orders, like the one deal with transportation war powers, is actually about a 50 or 60 year old executive order that executives about every 10 years update and say, if we get into a time of war, this is the steps that we would take on an emergency. He just updated that one. Now, we have less trust for this president than we've had for any president in a very long time. And so that's what rises it up. What I want to say, though, is the executive orders are kind of the shiny object that he flashes around over here, the real way he's moving power is through consent decrees, through the courts. And what will happen is he'll have an outside environmental organization sue the federal government, and then the EPA will settle with them out of court. Of course, to save the federal dollars, of course. But then the EPA and the Sierra Club will sit down, they'll make an agreement, and then they'll come to a federal judge and say two opposing parties have made an agreement, the federal judge signs off on it, and he's just expanded power. He rewrote, basically a part of law. We are pushing back on the consent decrees right now, and just to let you know, consent decrees, he has 59 of them that he's done in the past uh, four years. That's the bigger issue for us than the executive orders are. Now, some of the executive orders that he does are, are just pure manufacturing of power, the latest being the uh, federal pay, including congressional pay. My first response when I heard this, he's increasing the pay of congressmen was, you can't do that, I don't work for you. <coughs> Okay, these are three co-equal branches of government. You can't go, oh, you're doing a nice job. Why don't, you, why don't I give you a raise? Okay, it, that, that's not your authority to do. The president has said he has the authority to move money because we're under a continuing resolution, which gives more latitude in the spending. Now, I don't agree in that, but that is an extension of executive power through a gray area of the law because the Senate won't do a budget. Now, the Senate is all for that, but that's the kind of mode that we're in right now. So that, that has to be resolved, and at some point, our leverage has got to be forcing the Senate to try to get through a budget process so we can get that reestablished in appropriations more than anything else on that, on that part of it is. As far as the impeachment process, I don't think there's any way we can get 218 in the House, current standing, to actually go through it. We would ride a lot of swords, we'd make a lot of news, we'd change the, change the news stories of a couple of weeks of cycles, and we'd fail even in the House right now. Yes, the, the House has to do that in agreement with the Senate. How's that going to work? Yeah, and that's part of our issue, is that now that, that's, that's what I'm saying. We're in a really weird spot that we continue resolutions year after year, and their ability to be able to move dollars within the executive branch because of the continuing resolution, the Senate unwilling to do that, our only option is a full shutdown to try to force that mode, and now it affects everything military included. 
again, this is not like a 95 shutdown where the majority of the appropriations bills were already passed. So then it's a matter of how do we get to this spot and at what level do we do that? Thomas, why is there such a pushback against a possible, at least one component in the school shooting situation, and that being armed guards on premises? Why is there such a pushback against that? You know what? There, there's only a pushback because uh, Wayne LaPierre recommended it. That's really it. I have reminded multiple folks, Bill Clinton had this exact same idea. In fact, Bill Clinton in the 90s, after Columbine and all that, that happened there, did the whole, uh, remember the 100,000 cops on the street? Oh, yes. Yes. A part of that was funding for cops at schools. Armed, armed cops at schools. So th 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 this is not, they only hate it because the NRA recommended it. But this used to be a Democrat idea, and I've reminded multiple folks of that, and we'll continue to do that. But I don't think it should be a federal officer there, as has been recommended by some. I don't think that at all. State, 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 state. The only problem is you got a TSA in the school. You put TSA in. Put TSA in the school. That's what you got. You're going to have to be willing to shut the government down. Yeah, we've got to we've got to find the moments to be able to push that, and that's that's the continual rolling moment. That when when can you actually get there? But yes, sir. He has told us the speaker, and we've asked point blank. The speaker has told us he is done meeting with the president, and trying to form an agreement. Okay. That this will be through regular order. That will go through committees. That's correct. Then we resolve in a conference. You know what? And if we have compromise in a, in a conference committee, fine. That is a constitutional well, system to resolve that. We can. We we can. And that's the thing. That if we pass our bill early enough in the House and put the pressure up on the Senate, that's our focus right now. Is to say we're done. We did our part, Senate. You reciprocate. We're not going to negotiate something else. Well, and that's. That's the other part of our challenge is the general public understanding the legislative process. And it's hard to get past mainstream media that perverts it all the time. Oh, Sal. Congressman, thank you. Howdy. Uh, we all know that uh, Obama has a different set of values than we have. And so I don't really know how much you can do here, but I, I just want to know if you're aware of uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration that has a book called The Provider's Introduction to Substance Abuse Treatment for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Individuals. And they are going around the nation, they just did this here in Oklahoma, December the 7th, and having conferences, they're giving educational, uh, what do they call it, uh, continuing education units for these things. And uh, James Taylor over here went to one. Uh, We're gonna have him speak here. about that soon, okay. Alex. Anyway, my, my point is, is about 2% of the conference is dealing with substance abuse, abuse and mental health issues. 98% is doing with indoctrination of pushing the homosexual agenda. This is what our president is doing. He has a, a federal agency doing it. Our state, the Oklahoma Mental Health and Substance Abuse Department, put this conference on and is indoctrinating our citizens who are totally against this. Is there any way you can look into this? Is there anything oh, yes. that we can do to sure. yeah, I can, to you, I mean, this? You know I can absolutely get a chance to take a look at it and we'll start the process, try to see what we can do to identify it. Some of those things, you have the power of humiliation where you can erase it and put it in sunlight. They love functioning in the dark. Uh, and you put some sunlight on it, that does help. Um, but we'll see. <coughs> we can do that, but I'm glad to take that on. Yes, sir. gets in there. Thank you. That's really kind. I, I promise. I'm human and I'm not going to always get it right. But I, I take, I'm going to read the bill. I'm going to go through. I'm going to try to make a decision that's the right decision. On it. It's consistent with the Constitution. And it's consistent with what I'm seeing in the facts in front of me. So, thanks. Howdy, ma'am. Hey, hey, thank you, Congressman Langford. So good to see you. Uh, first of all, we are doing a survey of Oklahoma teachers, our members, on the gun issue. So we will publish those results. We will good. run that this month. Second, uh, both candidates mentioned cutting the donations on charitable organizations. 
how has that played out in this fiscal cliff and what has been decided? We can't get anything from anybody on that issue. In fact, every church and every nonprofit in this United States. And then uh, the third thing, and you may not be aware of this, but Barack Obama is pushing, you know, the core curriculum to nationalize the school curriculum, you guys. It's really serious. I know it's all sugar-coated. I know it looks pretty, but it's deadly. And so, what have you, do you know about that, and what is your position on that? I, I, have, I have personally spoken to John Klein, who's the chairman of the Education Committee, yes. to ask about that and where that's pushing. He says he's pushing back on that, Good. and the House bills will push away from that. Uh, which I will continue to hold it to. Now, you know better than most in here, almost nothing moved to the Education Committee last session. Almost nothing. Uh, the only thing that we moved through there, I think, was a charter schools bill was it. Uh, so there has to be some things that are dealt with during this next session because the annual yearly progress uh, uh, 2014 will make almost every single school in the nation um, basically what we would call the F grade in our, in our system. Uh, so there will be a big push on the education side. Uh, your second question, I'm so sorry, uh, Ginger, tell me your second question. It's the charitable giving. Charitable giving, thank you. There is a section of the fiscal cliff deal that was struck that takes people that make $250,000 or more and limits the amount that they can write off on their deductions. It basically caps it, caps it at a large amount, but it will enormously affect high income donors right. to charitable uh, organizations. And I have a concern for that. Obviously, I came out of a nonprofit background as well. I think nonprofits do it more efficiently than the government will ever do it. Yep. And the more we can incentivize nonprofits to do the ministry work that needs to be done, the better we'll be. Yes. So. There will be immigration discussions, and I, I want to say a couple things on that. One of them is, we need not panic, but engage. Because this will be rumor city as well. Once it gets started, I'm telling you, the left is going to start saying jackbooted thugs coming in the middle of the night to jerk people out. There will be folks on the right that no matter what you put on there will scream amnesty, and we'll, and we'll go through the whole process on this. There will be a lot of noise on it. Make sure we get the facts. This group is good at actually reading through the stuff and keeping up with the facts, but make sure you track the facts on it when we start to go through the process. Immigration is a federal issue, and it has been ignored for decades, and it has left us with somewhere between 11 and 13 million illegals living in this country, and the chaos that we have in our streets and the crime that we have in our streets because of it. We have to resolve this. Our purpose is, when we resolve it, the House passes a bill, the Senate passes a bill, we go through conference, we go through regular order, so it is in the sunshine. It is not some wide open thing. And that is something we have talked to Boehner about directly. To say, to make sure how this works through, everybody can see it. And so we can put a stake in the ground to be able to resolve this. Uh, I have my own perspectives on it. I'm going to tell you my own personal perspectives. I look at the first two lenses, not only the constitutional lens, but I look at the lens of every person on the planet is created in God's image and has value. Every person. But every person is also a citizen of some country. And in that country, they have unique rights and responsibilities. And when you leave and go to a different country, you have different rights and responsibilities. As I do in a different country, as someone else does coming to mind. So each person has to be treated with God-given value, but each person has to be honored in a way to say, what connects best with the country of your origin? And how does it work? Does that help? Robert so, and then Perlin, that would be our last day. Yeah, so, I can get the pressures on. James, a couple of things. I'm not going to go into these documents because I'm going to get into it okay. afterwards. But I, I want to make a comment here. Sister Cities International, and I think a lot of people in this room know I'm in the fight against the Jesus 21. Right. Sister Cities International, without a doubt, absolutely documented the UN telling us that it is an Agenda 21 program. Oklahoma City has about six sister cities uh, uh, relationships. Edmund recently uh, did one with Ingalls, Russia, named after Friedrich Ingalls, co-author of the Communist Manifesto. Right. Okay, there's a huge problem with these kind of programs that are seeping in. But while we're fighting with, about all these other things going on, this stuff is seeping in uh, behind us. Okay? Okay. Another one. Um, Robert, we've got to go quick. Okay, I've, I've got to say this one, Charlie. The 
American Bar Association has passed 11 resolutions since 1991 in support of sustainable development as defined by the UN in, in the UNSAID conference in 1992. That's where Agenda 21 was rolled out. I wonder how many attorneys in this room know that that is the case. The UN, in my opinion, is a continuing criminal enterprise. And I would like to know, why are we still funding because I, 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 you know it, and, and where I am on that completely. I the, the UN had a set purpose in its earliest days for trying to form relationships, but it has far left that, and our technology has far exceeded the purpose of what we have in the UN. <clears throat> the quote unquote benefits of what we could get out of the UN, we can do with the telephone now and over a Skype. Okay, and there are moments and places that we can get a chance to interact with leaders in regional meetings, but they do not need to be a place where third world dictators try to dictate to the rest of the world how to spend our money. It is a transition of wealth from wealthy nations to poorer nations is what the UN's sole purpose is right now. And I would be glad to defund them and do our relationships in another way. I'd be glad to What I'm concerned about, did I just hear you say a few minutes ago, kind of in a backdoor way, kind of priming the pump here, that you're getting ready to vote for a debt ceiling increase? I mean, what you said is it's kind of scary to give it to Bernanke and the Treasurer and Obama, but if we don't do something, they're going to have it. So is that kind of your way of telling us you're getting ready to vote to raise the debt ceiling again? I have made, I have made the same commitment that I made two years ago on it, that I want to see us a plan to get out of it. I have yet to have anyone, anyone say to me, here's how we can cut a trillion dollars of spending out next year. Ron Paul? Ron Paul? Ron Paul? No, no, it's not true. Get out of the world. Get us out of the world. Ron Paul is Wait, not hold, on, hold on a second. Ron Paul's plan, because I looked at it as well, is a very aggressive plan. Great. It has five debt ceiling increases in it. Not it has five. Oh, come on. It, it does. It has can five. Can expect that, a yes or no vote to raise the debt ceiling when you vote on it? Simple it, yes or no. No, I'm glad to. It will be a yes if it's attached to a plan to get us out. It will be a no if we don't. Because if if Ron Paul's plan has five debt ceiling increases in it, the Heritage Foundation has ten debt ceiling increases in it. You're talking about I'm, Rand Paul? I'm talking about Rand Paul, that's right. I'm talking about Rand Paul's plan on the Senate. We're talking about getting us out of undeclared wars. That's where our Great. Listen, I had a conversation with someone this morning saying I'm ready for us to get out of Afghanistan. I'm Thank sick you. of this. Thank you. And if, if we if we got out if we got out and came home in a week that we can do that in a legitimate way that protects our troops getting out, I would vote for it and I would support it. So I, I'm glad to do that. But we spent listen, we spent eighty eight billion dollars a year in Afghanistan. That does not solve a one point one trillion dollar hole. But we have ninety bases around the world. We don't need to be policing the world. You don't give charity to other people if you yourself are starving. We need those yep. I, we, we, we gotta go ahead. No, I, but let me let me comment. That we can close from there. All all of those. If you if you took all of our foreign aid, even Israel, it does not close the hole. If you pull us out of Afghanistan, it does not even get close to closing the hole. It is it is a start. But again, <laughs> yes, I wish I wish it was a trillion here, trillion there. It's billions. So, but you've got to find a way, and I'm telling you, I have laid this marker down to a bunch of people and said, show me how we get a trillion dollars out next month. I'll send it to you. Please do. Okay. Well, but, I, I don't want that kind of depression. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me say uh, just how much I appreciate it. As you can see, there are going to be people here that don't agree with everything, and, but I appreciate your willingness to come and speak. I have some gifts for you, sir. And this is a little bit of light reading on the airplane here and a short DVD on Agenda 21. I think you're probably pretty knowledgeable. This will help you understand the origins of the United Nations because it was never intended to be, uh, shall we say, a, 
society where we just talk and things. It was always intended to be the eventual seat of world government. Uh, let me just say this, folks. If you have not renewed your membership at Oak Pack, it expired the 31st of December. I've got a couple of membership forms over here. I have some more blank ones here. Please sign up. Um, and then next week we'll be watching the remainder of this DVD. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week.